George Hunter, the sadist, the hitman, and the murder of Jane Bashir. New book. Congratulations on the book. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate what it. What made you write it? Um, well, the publisher contacted me. It was a McFarland publisher, and they're, they're, they're doing a spinoff, uh, Exposite True Crime, so they're getting into true crime, and they actually contacted me. And I had written a previous book um, about the Tara Grant murder in 2007, and so they had first write a refusal, so I had to contact them and see if it was okay with them, and they said that's fine. They weren't interested in, in, in the true crime. So, you know, I went ahead and, and wrote the book. I like to have projects to keep me busy. I kind of have a restless mind. So if I don't have something to keep me busy, I, my mind wanders. So it was, it was, it's a lot of hard work. And, you know, people say you're making money off of it. You don't make much money off these things. You really don't. A couple thousand bucks. It's, it's more for, to make your mom proud. You know, and to, it, again, I like to have, I like to have a project just to keep me busy. All of us out there covering it, you know, you couldn't help as a human being to say, this does sound like a book, this does sound like a movie. So you went ahead and compiled everything, all of your reporting on it, and then you've dug deeper since yes. uh, the sentencing. So what do you hit on in here that's new and that uh, you really like? Well, we, we talked to people who knew him. Um, my wife Lynn and I, the uh, co-author, we, we went to the church and talked to some people who knew Bob growing up and knew Jane. And so we got a little more in depth about who they were, and you know, and we went into the S and M community. That was a big part of this this case. And you know, it, it's not just being salacious by bringing that in. This was central to the mur the reason why Jane was murdered. And so we went into that a little bit, and went into like the history of the scene in Detroit, and and uh, kind of took you into the dungeon. We talked to people who were in the in the these S and M parties with Bob. And one of the interesting, one of the important things to note here is that even people within that community, they weren't happy with him. They were concerned that, that a lot of this was going to reflect on them. As I said earlier, let's say if a gay person killed somebody, you know, or whatever group, people would say, oh, well, we don't want that to reflect on us as a whole. And that was the same here. They, they, there was a lot of talk on Fet Life, which is sort of the Facebook for people in that lifestyle, that, you know, pe that people are going to equate S&M with murdering people, and that's not the case at all. It's, it's, a, it's, it's just something that they do, they enjoy. Um, the, at, at one of the woman, women I talked to uh, who attended parties with Bob explained that you, at these parties you get people, lawyers and you know laborers and, and doctors and everything in between, so they're just normal folks who are, who are expressing that lifestyle. You can't really put this, you can't shoehorn the negative things that Bob brought to the table into that lifestyle. So I, I went into that pretty deep that, you know, a lot of the stuff you can't really report in what they call a family newspaper. Um, but how hard was it to find people that were in the dungeon and how willing were they to talk to you for your book? It wasn't easy. Uh, a lot of people didn't want to talk. Uh, I talked to a woman who didn't want to give her first name because she said, or her last name because she, uh, she said my mom might be reading this, but she went into detail about not just Bob, but just the lifestyle in general. And again, that's a, that's a very, it's, that's, that's central to this case. Early on in, in, in the reporting, when, uh, days after Jane was killed, um, I had a great source in Homicide, one of these unnamed sources, and he told me Bob has a sex dungeon in, underneath his bar, and I knew that before it got reported, but I asked him, does that have anything to do with the case? And he said, well, not, we're not sure yet. And I said, well, okay, well, that doesn't, then I don't care. I'm not going to report that he had the, the, the husband of the victim has a kinky side. That's not newsworthy to me. Um, but the minute, that, of course, then then they then you know then they started coming out with the the Hinky Meter website. If you remember that, she did. You know, bloggers can do some fantastic journalism. There, there's sometimes a thought. There's an elitism in in, in the legacy, you know, of, of newspapers and TV. The folks we work for that they're lesser, but that's absolutely not the case. And she did fantastic reporting. And and then you know it kind of all unraveled from there. Then my source told me, yeah. We are, you know, we're looking at this S and M as not only being part of the case; it's central to the case. Central and he, a motive that he wanted to commit to that lifestyle, and he couldn't have his wife with. Sure. Is that that? That's the motive. Well, yeah, Big Bob, who was Big Bob, who tooled around Gross Point in the in the Navigator with with the you know, license plate. Big Bob said, license Big Bob, plate. And he had this big coffee mug. You're the man, Bob. Um, but. That was his image, but Jane had all the money. He was broke. 
So he, his, his goal was to set himself up in this house as Master Bob with concubines, you know, the, this harem of slave girls serving him. Um, but how's he going to do that if he doesn't have any money? He, he's kind of, you know, he's not the dog guy, but he's not the most attractive guy in the world. He has erectile dysfunction that came out in the trial. Um, you know, so he, how else is he going to get these women to join up with him in this, you know, to serve him in this household if he's not ha if he doesn't have a bunch of money? So the prosecutor's central um, allegation, which turned out, you know, he was found guilty. So we're going to say this was his his motivation was to um, to kill his wife, and she had eight hundred thousand dollars in her four hundred one k. She Jane was very meticulous. She was from the very beginning. She socked all her money into savings. She was very, very. Um, and he wanted that money. Yeah, he wanted it. He didn't have any money. If there was a divorce, he'd be broke. He made like eighteen thousand dollars one year. So his image of this entrepreneur, of, you know, this wheeler dealer, um, it, it was all false. It was all false. That brings me to my last two questions. I always think about Jane Beshear in this as being, you know, she's the victim. And the reporting that I did on it was I always started with her, not to forget about. Jane in this and I know you you did the same thing but how do you how did you talk about Jane in the book as far as there's this huge figure in the book is Bob Beshear well, and he's you know everything's about him he wants everything to be about him but then you've got Jane who did all the right things in life and she was murdered yeah and it's it's kind of the the built-in tragedy of reporting sometimes is that when someone lives a good lifestyle and does the right things as everybody said about Jane and again I the victim, the people will always say the victim was great, but you'll sometimes hear whispers, you know, I've been doing this, you've been doing this a long time. You hear things, people will say, well, you know, such and such wasn't so great. Nobody said a bad thing about Jane. She was a wonderful woman from all accounts. And unfortunately, that's not really newsworthy when you compare it to a guy who lives a double life, has a sex dungeon, he wants his wife killed so he can set himself up in this household as master Bob. I mean, that's going to get all the attention. And it always does in, in a murder case. It's always the murderer and not the victim. I won't say always, but in almost every, even when it's a celebrity involved, O.J. Simpson, O.J. got all the, all the um, it's not usually the victim who gets focused on, especially when you have a period of time, and this is what really will ramp up national interest in a case that happened with Stephen Grant, which we covered. Um, when you have a period of time before there's an arrest where the husband looks really guilty and, and he's out there crying crocodile tears or what seems to be crocodile tears, that whets the appetite of the bloggers and, and people. And as reporters, we have to be real careful because he looks guilty as hell. But we have to put that aside and say, okay, we're, I have suspicions. We're human beings. We're going to have suspicions. But I need to put that aside and just focus on the facts. And sometimes that's not easy because you're a human. You have, you know, this guy seems like a you know, really piece of work here. And he's, he seems to be lying. He dabbed at the non-existent tears. And there's a quick story that um, one of his friends was in the house before that infamous, it was an infamous press conference for, you know, whoever paid attention to that. It blew up that he didn't have any tears and he dabbed at his dry eyes. Well, right before that, according to his friend, they were in the house and the media was gathered outside. He was preparing for this press conference with his mom and his son. And he whips out the handkerchief and the, the, the friend, Michael Carmody, said he was flippant about it. It's like, hey, I can't forget this handkerchief, you know, in case I need it. And sure enough, he whips it out and dabs it. And later on, he said, well, he thought there might be tears or something. That's chilling. I was standing out there with you on the other side of the door waiting for him to come out. And that's the inside information of what happened uh, that's in your new book. He, Bob Bashir, was almost willing to talk to you for this book, but he had some conditions? Well, yeah, my wife, Lynn, um, a co-author, she wrote him a letter saying, you know, hey, we'd like to get your side of the story. And he wrote back with, it was like a four-page letter, rambling that the media were slaves to the law enforcement and we didn't tell the truth. And he said that if, you know, he would talk, he would consider talking to us if we, uh, you know, complied with this long list of, so he was still trying to be Master Bob and control things. He did that in the courtroom. The, the list included sending money to some preacher. We had to gather all the uh, news stories that had been written about him and submit them to them. And, and I said, we're not gonna do that. 
And he's, you know, it's not because we're veering from the truth. You don't need to skew the truth in order to make Bob look bad. Bob did that all by himself. If you, you know, the things that came out in the trial and, and as I was writing the book, it's like little things because there was so many bombshells dropped in this thing that, you know, and, and as we discussed earlier off the camera here, is that you have to always remember there's a mother of two who's been murdered. I mean, when you, sometimes the victim can become abstract. When you have a big national, a white hot story, you know, and, and there's scoops and you're, you, the story, the, the people sometimes, they're in danger of becoming abstract. You know, because the story, it's a beast, you have to keep feeding it. You get one story, let's say you get a scoop, you're, that's like chum to your editor. It's like, okay, what do you got today? What do you got today? And of course you want, you want to have, you know, that, it's a competitive business. But you always have to say, wait a minute, there's a mother of two who's been murdered, there's a family here, and honestly, that can get lost because it's a vortex of stories. And in this particular case, there were so many amazing, unbelievable bombshells that were dropped. So you kind of have to keep your eye on the ball Definitely. Know, as a reporter. Last question, have you ever had anything being on the street for so long that just kept revealing shocking detail after it just got wilder the no. more it was looked into no i don't think i've ever the stephen grant case was similar in in a few ways that, that that had the culmination of him running up north and things um but no i've never covered anything and i've covered some terrible people um bob's up there as far as the worst people i've ever covered because this was all just predicated on greed and selfishness and he wanted to live this lifestyle and he had a good life um, but he wanted more and he was willing to kill for it and have his wife killed just you know So so yeah, I've, I've never covered anything this crazy where you're staking the guy's house out and following him everywhere And and you know, it was like Elvis at, at some point You know it kind of and, and I can see it kind of got ridiculous to stake his house out every day and you know follow him you know, and the question is, can you well, from our from my point of view, I was there because we didn't know what was going to happen. Sure, and we had to find out. Absolutely, there yeah. was so much that we, happened. From something day was to happening day. all the time. Oh yeah, one time when he went to his uh, lawyers, they had a helicopter. It was like O.J. Simpson. They, it was like the old infamous Bronco ride. You know, the question is, can you still be fair to somebody when you're covering them that closely? Uh, you know, you're covering him like he's Elvis. Can you still be fair? And I think the media was fair. We gave him his chance to say what he wanted to say. We played it down the middle in our story. Maybe the amount of coverage might have been over the top, but the coverage itself was very fair, I thought. You know, I think most we have great reporters here in Detroit. You're one of them. And, and you know, it, people played it down the middle. They're not going to skew it. And his, his claims that the media were out to crucify him, are dead wrong. Like I said, we well, didn't the facts know. spoke for themselves, and you point out that he had every chance in the world to tell his story outside and on the on the stand. Yeah, long rambling four days of all day long on the witness stand. He got more time than most people do to make his claim, his side of the story. And we put that in the book too. You know, I, I'm I'm a journalist. I want to give everybody their say. But again, we don't have to skew the facts to make Bob look bad. Bob did a perfect job of that by himself. We can talk a long time for a long time about this particular case. But George, thank you for your time. Congratulations on the book. Appreciate it, Sean. Thanks a lot.